Thank you. I think, first of all, I'd like to talk a little bit about presidential leadership and how it influences decision making in athletics. It's been a while since the media has been full of the whole Penn State Jerry Sandusky scandal, which was so prevalent uh, during the revealing of his uh, molestation of young boys, and that Penn State in some way enabled this to happen. You know, when you really uh, read all the l literature and documentation, you understand that, in fact, the leadership at Penn State failed miserably in preventing and enabling the Sandusky acts to occur on campus. But there's other examples of presidential leadership failing when it comes to athletics. We have the UConn situation, where a basketball team is not eligible for an NCAA championship and postseason play. We have cases where at Southern California, the University of Miami, and other Division I institutions, where again, the money and the pressure to win and the culture surrounding lack of transparency with athletics forced the president to be able to not take a leadership role in controlling the athletics. Why doesn't this occur in schools like Wesleyan University and other NESCACs and well led Division III schools. It's because the presidents really are in control. The NESCAC conference, having some of the strongest Division III institutions in the country, still is, has you know, rules which prevent it from really uh, being uh, a school that could be considered where athletics have run away with their place on campus. Uh, the presidents really have full control of what all the decisions that are made the length of the playing season, uh, the time away from campus, postseason play opportunities, and when, they, and, and when they can occur and when they not can occur, and more so really reacting very carefully to all the recommendations that are made by the NESCAC athletic directors on behalf of the coaches. It really is one of the few conferences in the country that we can say the presidents are in charge, and sometimes to the dismay of the coaches and the athletic directors, but overall, I think makes us all proud of the way we conduct our athletic program. Um, but one other comment I'd like to make as a follow-up to our guests from the squash team this evening is a really tribute to our coach, Shona Kerr, and the way that she's built this program over the last, particularly the last four to five years, where really we've seen a dramatic change in the attitude and the culture surrounding our squash team. This has come with a lot of hard work and a lot of visibility on her part. She's run a summer camp at Wesleyan where she's brought the top names internationally to campus um, to attract students to come here and consider Wesleyan as a possible place that they would like uh, matric matriculate. But it's also just been, I think, a more uh, positive attitude about squash at Wesleyan and telling the squash community that we're really serious about building a program. One of the uh, individuals that she's had on campus a couple times is someone by the name of John Powers, who when he was on campus involved in this summer squash camp was rated as the top men's squash player in the world. With these kind of people who are first name friends of Shona, obviously the word gets out that Wesleyan is serious about the game and it really has players now that really want us to succeed. And with the great record that we have and the two student athletes that represented the women's squash team today, I think you can understand why really the future is very bright from squash at Wesleyan. Thank you very much.